you want people to listen to your ideas and you want to point out how things are wrong and how they need to be changed, it's a very difficult message. Uh, George Bernard Shaw has said in the, early in his career that pressing people to learn things they do not want to know is as unwholesome and disastrous as feeding them sawdust. So what do you do to make that go down, make the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down is actually a bit of salt and that it's wit, so wit being the salt of life. You've got to ch give them the message in a way that entertains them. So Shaw did that with socialism, pacifism, reform of the English language, all of the difficult things. He b managed to basically make a shotgun marriage of wit and morality, and he did it in his plays. In the process of doing that, he reinvented the English stage and became the towering literary figure of his time. But people always wanted to hear what he had to say, even if it was always holding up a mirror to society and showing all of the different ways it was not logical and should be reformed. Now, in our own time, uh, I pick a Louis C.K. as my example of uh, a wit who is, really has a deep social message with everything he does. And basically, with him, everything he says is all premised around the idea that humans are embarrassing and take everything for granted and basically stupid and lazy. But he uses himself as he doesn't exclude himself from that characterization. In fact, he puts himself at the center of it. So, uh, you know, there's this famous bit that's shown here that every, everything is amazing and no one is happy, which he's done on talk shows, talk about uh, the cell phone, all the modern technology we have and how irritated we get with it. Um, so that sort of launched him into prominence in uh, 2009. But the, the bit I like better is he, he talks about death and how we're so afraid to talk about death. And he likens it to being as though we're all together, in, all of us humans are on a bus that's going to Pittsburgh. But you can never, ever mention to anyone else on the bus that you're going to Pittsburgh. If you do, they'll shush you and say, and they'll say God, you're so obsessed with Pittsburgh. And then he, to which he responds, well, it says it on the effing tickets and it says it on the front of the bus. It's like, why can't we talk about it? So this is, again, and then death, of course, is the great taboo, but he manages to put it at the, at, in his bits and get people to laugh at it. So that is how he can use his righteous wit. So let's say you don't want to change the world. Let's say you just want to win over your boss or your in-laws or the people attending your talk at the Rotman School. That's when you want charm. And now the most charming man in modern history is uh, Cary Grant. That's, you can't even argue with that. And how he became so charming is best summed up by Pauline Kael, a uh, famous film critic, which who wrote in her essay, The Man from Dream City, that Cary Grant only became Cary Grant when he learned to project his feelings of absurdity through his characters and to make a style out of their feeling silly. And that, I think, is the essence of charm, that idea that he was constantly in these situations where ridiculous things were happening around him and the audience could look to him and then see the expression on his face and his actions and his comments and they knew that that was the appropriate response to that sort of absurdity. So that's easy to do when you look like Cary Grant and you're a matinee idol. What if you look like a potato? Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, uh, is certainly charming, but he doesn't have, he always looks like he's slept on a park bench, I don't, as though he doesn't comb his hair, his tie always has the, the shorter end sticking out longer than the longer end, uh, but he manages to get away with it by being completely authentic at all times, so I'm giving the air of that. And his buffoonery is just Boris being Boris, and it's worked, uh, it's probably going to make him prime minister, I will predict that here tonight, uh, because he's just so good at doing what he does. Um, it's memorably, during the London Olympics, he got caught on a zip line in the middle and was just hanging there wearing a blue helmet and kicking his legs. It's the kind of thing that no other politician could survive. Well, some in this city's recent memory, maybe. But, <laughs> but a self-respecting politician would have a hard time bouncing back from that. But Boris could do it. He, could, he uh, was, it was uh, picking up litter, cleaning the streams day in London. He falls into the pond. And some people actually wondered, did he fall into the pond on purpose? Did he do that just to get the joke out of it? And uh, I, I think that's a fascinating idea, the fact that he might actually be putting on this level of incompetence and buffoonery. Uh, and he has been accused of that by his critics. And what I think is most funny about that is that they're saying he's working so hard at it, and this is, he's never going to be prime minister, to which I would say, hey, well, look at Winston Churchill. <laughs>